Dana Jacobson from CBS Saturday Morning. Welcome to The Dish. Today we're exploring Chicago's delicious eats. We visit a Hyde Park spot celebrating Southern food and black culture where everyone can feel at home. And we sink our teeth into a steak grilled Argentinian style over an open flame. But we begin with a Chicago restaurant where the food is inspired by the wine instead of the other way around. Master sommelier Alpana Singh crossed into the kitchen and runs her restaurant without a chef. Adriana Diaz took a sip and a bite at Singh's Eatery. The vibe at one of Chicago's newest restaurants is fierce feminine energy. Yeah, Lady so we Gaga. have Lady Gaga, Frida Kahlo, Madonna, Elizabeth Taylor. Of Owner Beyonce. Alpina Singh is paying tribute to women doing things on their own terms. I ordered six bottles so we can at least try it. Maybe Which is exactly what the wine expert is like doing at her aptly named Alpina. The sommelier's job is to find the wine that best pairs with what the chef creates. But it was never our job to go into the kitchen. It was almost considered disrespectful. This didn't go yet, right? But she's breaking industry rules, creating the dishes herself with confidence that came from cooking during quarantine. My friends, they were like, wow, this is really good. You should put this on the menu. Did it feel almost like you were not staying in your lane? Yeah, you know, I had a, I, I approached a couple of my friends about like, well, who's going to be the chef? I'm like, we don't have a chef. And they thought I was crazy. But I think part of me really changed after the pandemic. I think we saw a lot of Americans that are like, you know what? It's either now or never. The California native moved to Chicago 20 years ago with just a few boxes of books and clothes and Rose, owning multiple restaurants and hosting the iconic Chicago restaurant show, Check Please. Take us through, if you're going to Gogi, how should we order? Are you recognized on the street? Um, I, I do get recognized. I always get check wine. <laughs> <laughs> she says her food was inspired, of course, by wine. These Pinot Noir and mushrooms are like peanut butter and jelly. They love each other. <laughs> <laughs> Dishes like the popular crispy polenta and mushrooms are comforting yet complex. The mushroom like it pops more. Just kind of like took over when Correct. I had the wine. Then there's the delicate tuna crudo, meant to shape shift based on the wine pairing. Mm. And then go back with some of it still in your mouth. Okay. And then go with the Riesling. Creates oh, this wow. sensation of different flavors. It's like waves of flavors, like the ocean. Yes, where you don't know where the tuna starts and the wine ends. It's sort of a seamless pairing. For your perfect pairing, Singh shared some sommelier secrets. Love my guacamole and chips, but it's even better with a glass of Sauvignon Blanc because the Sauvignon Blanc acts like lime juice over the guacamole. Because of the acidity. The acidity, so it kind of brings it alive. And then with red wine, here's an easy tip. Turn the wine on its side. If you can see through it, then you can pair it with things like fish. Singh was introduced to the restaurant world by her parents, ethnically Indian immigrants from the Fiji Islands. Her father was a dishwasher, her mother a server, and it wasn't a path they envisioned for her. I will say that when I told my mom I wanted to become a master sommelier, she says, oh, I am so excited. So tell me, what part of the body does the sommelier specialize in? What part of the body? Yeah, she thought it was a medical specialty. <laughs> I had to break it to her that it was drinking. <laughs> Singh pursued a spot with the country's most prestigious and competitive wine organization. So I thought, okay, well, this exam has a pass rate of 3%. Why not me? And I think that sentence right there is what launched my career. Why not why me? Why not me? All of the greats say, why, why not, not me? me? She passed at just 26, becoming the youngest and first woman of color to earn the title Master Sommelier. I got a lot of accolades for being young, and I'm very grateful for that. But let's face it, they don't hand out 40 over 40 awards. We live in a society that tends to focus and celebrate youth, particularly with women, and then we kind of disappear from 40 until about 80, and then we become a national treasure. <laughs> you know, so, you know, there's a lot of work to be done between 40 and 80, and in fact, some of our best work. She says her best work yet is at Alpena which is not just her name, it's also her neighborhood. How are you? How you feeling, buddy? You look great. Uh, your son came in for dinner, your son and your daughter-in-law. But we see the color on it. Now she's adding teacher to her plate with wine education classes for her staff. 
I see my dad in all of their faces. I see my mom in all of our servers. Having a Barolo with a white flesh fish would not go. That was like the, one of the main reasons that I wanted to work here, the wine program and just Alpina herself. Other women come up to me and I said, you know, I read about your story, I heard about you, and I thought, wow, maybe I could do that. And this is how we start changing the face of what it means to have sort of a, you know, a stereotypical, just one group doing a profession. You know, it's because we all said, why not me, and decided to put ourselves in the ring. And that, I kid you not, it will mean something to somebody eventually. Up next, Southern classics with a side of virtue. You're watching The Dish. Chef Eric Williams kicks hospitality up a notch at his restaurant Virtue. He wants both diners and employees to feel cared for when there. That includes serving his food on the good china, something he never did growing up. I tasted some of the James Beard Award winners' best dishes. Walleye is 2, 130. Virtue Restaurant is as much a reflection of its diverse and historic Hyde Park neighborhood. Cornbread, share, cornbread, share as it is its name. Virtue, by its very definition, is high moral standard. If it's anything I can do to help, let me know. The standard is kindness. The standard is taking care of people. The standard is treating people the way you would want to be treated. I appreciate that. Well, thanks for your support. That's a pretty sick stove. The first solo endeavor for executive chef and owner Eric Williams. Fire gumbo green tomato, gumbo green tomato. It is also a reflection of him. Look, we're unapologetically black. I, I can't be anything else. It is definitely who I am, and it is definitely how I'm cooking. However, I'm recognized as a chef, not as a black chef first, as a chef professional first that happens to be black. And so inflections of who I am should be identifiable in the food that I cook. I need that collard green now, ma'am. At Virtue, that means Southern cuisine, like chicken and andouille sausage gumbo, with Carolina gold rice, which creates a, a really, really interesting texture because it doesn't cook in 10 minutes, and it actually has texture and nutrients. Braised short ribs with creamed spinach and crushed potatoes. On your right is a little bit of our gem lettuce salad with kind of an interesting ingredient. We took black eyed peas and oh, made them the croutons, yeah. so they're fried black eyed peas on the salad. But as a chef who's trained in Italian and French cooking, Williams sees even more. There are so many things that show up in Southern food that people identify as Southern food but don't really think about the history or, or how that may have come about. What we want to do is we, we want to think about how food can be delicious, how it can be progressive, but how it also preserves the flavor profiles of the South without everything coming immediately out of the fryer. Like the blackened catfish with Carolina gold rice, and barbecue carrots. This is wonderful. The Thank seasoning you. on this, it's like a little kick. Oh, it definitely has a little bit of um, <laughs> spice. There's blackening spice on the catfish, and that's what lends to that flavor. Oh, my gosh. And for dessert, Millie's banana pudding. Chef Becky Pendola, mm -hmm. her grandmother made phenomenal banana pudding, and it's a very nostalgic space for her. So this is a labor of love. Um, so Becky makes the best. The same can be said for the entire restaurant. There are a lot of things that go into it, to be perfectly honest, like the idea that I grew up in a home where the china was kept in a china cabinet, but we never ate on it. And at this point in my life, I really want to eat on the china. From the chintz pattern on that china to homey touches, like an array of pillows, everything throughout Virtue is a part of the experience. These are holes that have been reclaimed from fire trucks that were used to break riots, or as they were called, protests against black people during the civil rights movement. The artwork in the restaurant helps set the tone. Uh, that is the first piece that was hung. Woven throughout the space, it is all by African-American artists. Why is it so important to have a space like this? As you mentioned, it's, it's the food, it's the culture, it's the ownership, it's the art on the wall, it's every aspect of it. Because in the past, we've seen a lot of other cultures take agency of a culture that's not theirs. At some point, when do we take agency of our own culture and of our own space? And so we want to continue 
to not just polarize what soul means to us and what Southern means to us, but we want to celebrate it. Williams grew up on the west side of Chicago, a rough or what he calls challenging neighborhood. It was in River North at Chicago's famed restaurant MK where he built his career. Over two decades, Williams worked his way up from salad station to celebrated chef and partner. You should get paid twice when you're at work. You should, you should get paid your check, and then you should get paid through education. And I had a really, really thorough education in that space. When MK closed, Williams brought some of the philosophies behind it to virtue, like passing on that education. So we're going to do black and catfish. Serving as a mentor as part of Embark Chicago, a program that provides experience-based learning opportunities to low-income high school students. Can I put this down and lay away? I've been in under-resourced communities my entire life, and so I know what it feels like to uh, witness and, and be privy to resources, and I know what it feels like to be without. We just take a very practical approach, teaching life skills in, in you know, our everyday practice and showing the parallels or the life application as to how those things relate. There you go. Virtue in name and practice. Let me know when you want to work the fish station. <laughs> I got a spot for you. There's not a team member here that we wouldn't extend ourselves for, that we didn't make an attempt to extend ourselves for during the pandemic. And every manager and or partner that's a part of this establishment are people that I have relationships with that grew out of our experience in the restaurant and that continue to flourish as a result of the philosophy of taking care of one another. You know, I'd be remiss if I didn't say, right, we're, we're still in a pandemic. Mm -hmm. We still have challenges that we have to face in the world. We're glad that people can create nostalgic moments um, in a place that, that is beginning to feel very, very nostalgic to us. After the break, feeling the heat at a unique Windy City Steakhouse. You're watching The Dish. El Che Steakhouse in Chicago's West Loop has a unique cooking method. The restaurant steaks aren't pan-roasted, grilled, or baked. They're cooked over an open flame. Meg Oliver sat down with executive chef John Mannion to learn about the Latin-influenced bites. This is like a stage, this is the set, and when somebody walks in, they don't know what they're walking into, and they, they see this, they come around the corner. It is a holy moment. At El Che Steakhouse in Chicago. That holy moment starts with a vision of flames on a 12-foot traditional Argentine grill. So basically, we light a fire back there, we make charcoal, and we cook. That's it, there's no gas line on that line. We cook everything over embers or over charcoal. A little beef fat on the tartare bread. The master of the menu is chef and owner John Mannion. Tartare is four pieces. Who likes to brag 90% of the food is grilled over live fire. Like this signature steak dish, a 32 ounce dry aged ribeye cap served with charred knob onions, chimichurri and salsa criolla. Why do you call it the party steak? It was completely a knee jerk. The first time that we did this, we put it on a plate and I was like, that's a party, that's a party steak. It looks like it's gonna be a big kind of chewy flank or skirt steak, but it is pure ribeye with all the intermuscular fat. Melt in your mouth. Mm-hmm. So perfect. There's definitely a fun vibe here. You can't ignore like the Latin influence. There's not a lot of other steakhouses where you're going to have empanadas, but also like this beautiful grilled seafood that we sort of specialize in. Oh, my like grilled lobster with Diavolo butter, pickled shallots and scallion. Grilled oysters with smoked onion aioli, bacon and topped with chips. Potato chips. Yeah, potato chips, crumbled up potato <laughs> chips. I'm a Midwestern kid, you know. <laughs> also on the table, a bone-in prime ribeye. There's something very Midwestern about a big, dumb piece of meat sitting in front of you. <laughs> would you like a piece? I would love a piece. Pastured and then grain finished. Dry aged for about 42 days. Grilled over charcoal, treated with the utmost respect. Finished with uh, what we call beef whip. So good, so tender. 
melt in your mouth. Mm -hmm. Just as delicious, shrimp with scallion lime aioli and salsa matcha and beef fat fries. This is like the heady days of yore with McDonald's where they used to fry their fries in suet. This is that. And for dessert, a classic flan. So next course, one Delaware oyster, a little bit of rendered bacon. Mannion opened El Che Steakhouse, which translates into the dude, to create an experience for diners reminiscent of his childhood. When you're back here cooking in front of this fire, what kind of memories do you remember about growing up and your trips to South America? I mean, it's not just South America, right? It's like, it's summertime. It's like Weber grills in the backyard. It's weenies. It's everything. Cooking over fire is so universal and primal. It's all of that. A Midwesterner at heart, Mannion was born in Detroit, but his family moved to Brazil when he was eight years old. An intense culture shock that instantly made a lasting impression on his taste buds. The first day when I was feeling overwhelmed, we went to the pool. It was a hotel in the middle of the city, and they had a steak sandwich. It was a beautiful, like, crusty roll. It was ribeye. It couldn't have been anything else. And my dad and I split it, and honestly, when I took a bite, I knew it was going to be okay. You know? It was like, <laughs> you remember that as an eight-year-old? I remember that to this day. The family immersed themselves in the culture and celebrated the food. The thing that sticks with me the most, and what changed for our family, I believe, is that food became so central to our life. You know, at dinner, it was what's for lunch. At lunch, it was what's for dinner. Breakfast is for amateurs. And that's how we lived our lives. It was always around the table. We ate together every night. So that sense of community, that sense of like sharing food really became fully ingrained in who I am as a human being. So this, what we're gonna do is we're just gonna put this up here. But years later, when they returned to the States, Mannion graduated from college and started working in public relations. I remember going home and talking to my dad, and he was like, man, this is not you. What do you want to do with your life? And I always kind of knew that I wanted to be in the restaurant business. So right then and there, I decided this is what I'm going to do. So he enrolled in culinary school, and after working in the industry, started traveling to Argentina, where he fell in love with open fire cooking. What did you discover when you were on those long trips? My mind was blown by this method of cooking. Grilling is religion in Argentina. It is community, and there, grilling is community. Grilling is life. Keeping with the Latin theme, Mannion switched to an exclusively South American wine list when they reopened after the pandemic. What is this? We poured uh, the Zucardi Concreto, which is a Malbec that is aged in just uh, concrete. Picks up mm. no oak. It's just a pure expression of the soil, the growing conditions, and then the grape itself. Everything in the restaurant tells a story from his travels, from the tapestries and guitar on the wall to the bullhorn over the hearth. What inspires you in the kitchen when you're grilling? I mean, my inspiration now comes from a lot of different places. It comes from memories. It comes from traveling now. There's something about just lighting a fire and cooking food over it. There's no safety net, there's no gadget, there's nothing that's going to help you. I think that oftentimes we ignore these skills that we had forever for convenience. This is the hard way. This is the absolute hardest way to cook in this restaurant. For more stories like these and live coverage of breaking news 24-7, stream us right here on CBS News. I'm Dana Jacobson. We'll see you next time for another helping of The Dish.